Okay, so now we're in the museum, or do you want to give it its full proper name? Sorry. Yeah, so we are now in the uh, Lapua Cartridge Factory Museum, part of our museums. So as we really covered the museum, um, the factory kind of started as a sawmill, but it really, really carry out as well as plants, so they, the state bought the area for their own car- bullet cartridge production in in 1920s but to put it in perspective the Finnish state became independent in 1917 and before that Finland has had been about 100 years under Russian rule and basically Finland had the Russian governance like the police forces the military ammunition everything came from Russia but after that when Finland became independent, it was necessary to have the state owned own production for ammunition and law enforcement and everything. And uh, in 1980, there was uh, kind of related this was the civil war in Finland, which was fought like, uh, between the house owners, the whites, and the socialist threats. And that was also partially because there was a power vacuum in Finland at that point. So it, there wasn't really like police force. And the one reason for the civil war was that there was like a Suojeluskunta kind of a protection brigade kind of movement in the rightist white, white parts of Finland and in the, the red, red areas of Finland where there was separate similar kind of operations that they basically kind of worked as a paramilitary, uh, as, as the name implies, kind of peace-oriented paramilitary service, and of, which eventually collided. and uh, they, they became two kind of almost armies or, or forces that were fighting for, for power, basically. Yeah. And there was the... This is the, this is the Civil Guard, isn't it? Basically, there's a there's a Civil Guard museum, for example, in Seinijoki. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's rather to that, that phenomenon, yeah. And we are in a, a traditionally white area. Yeah, yeah. Politi- that, politically. Yeah, it, it's really, really white and nationalistic kind of region, huh? and it has been so throughout, throughout the years. And basically, the, like the, uh, the borderline divide between the red and white Finland was kind of like, uh, like the south, southern Finland was mostly the red, red area. Bit, bit more, more north, north from Tampere region, and um, like a real north, north from there was mostly white. Right. Okay. But yeah, that was like the really short, really short history yeah, about yeah. the background, why the factory was prepared, prepared for the state's use, and the factory operated until '76 until it moved. After the explosion, and, and the company that's there now, I mean, the, the, it's still making ammunition yeah. um, for for hunting and also for sport. So when you're watching the um, the biathlon, the, the <laughs> we call it um, the ski shooting, um, a lot of the a lot of the skiers are using Lapua branded ammunition still today. Yeah, and uh, when you go for a, like in United States or Saudi Arabia or any places where there are big big gun shows and uh, ammunition fairs, usually the big L, L logo you see there, it's the, it stands for Labua. Yeah, you okay. usually see it like in sponsors and big stands and everything. It's it's a really, really big brand in worldwide even still. Yeah, so, the, so from, from those early early days of necessity, it's still something that brings some international focus on Labua as a town. Yeah. Well, the, one of the big innovations in La Pocartes factory was the engineering of the D torpedo kind of a bullet, a D bullet, okay. that it said that it was engineered here in around 20, 27, 36. And it, it's still in use, partially modified, but it was kind of big breakthrough back, back in the day. Okay. And it was really something that got the worldwide attention. There was a lot of uh, Russian uh, Soviet, Soviet Union spies around Finland in the war time and even after that they, it was really one of the secrets they wanted to find out and it was 
like every everyday business the spying and counter spying against the Soviet spies and mm. one of the kind of tra- tragic stories was that the eventually a Russian spy got hold of the blueprints for the D bullet and got away with them to the Soviet Union and it was kind of interesting because this whole factory area was fenced off and all the gates had a soldier watching over them mm. and apparently back in the day the We, we don't know his real identity, but this man called Mr. Stan somehow bribed his way into the factory area and managed to uh, in a more cap- cap- captivate the uh, young woman who was the housekeeper for the officer uh, Walter Asplund, who is picture is over there, and basically managed to get the blueprints, and he also convinced uh, probably the hand, handmaid was was more or less romantically interested into this okay. man but he managed to speak her to uh, put some arsenic into the Walter Asplund's coffee and murder him while, while getting away with the blueprints. Okay, so that that is obviously not to be encouraged but as as it goes being a spy managing to break in, steal the blueprints and kill the kill the enemy He was he was an effective spy. Yeah, uh, it was like a real deal back back in the day mm. that there were were Soviet spies and there was counter spy activities and it was um, daily day, daily life and re- real thing to watch out for back in the day. And also during the war time there was a lot of Soviet bombing to the area because they knew that around here is a big bullet factory that is supplying the opposing forces because uh, it, during the winter one and the continuous war in the 30s and 40s, there was a big war between Finland and Soviet Union. Of course, ammunition factories are always a target for... Yeah, for a prime bombing. target, but they actually ne- never hit the factory because it was like area-wide uh, instruction to during dark time you cover your windows sure. so any, no light comes out. And then they also set up uh, decoy fires in the forests. Okay. So the Russian planes mostly bombed the forests. Yeah, this blackout is something that's very familiar to me growing up in London and yeah. seeing the historical stories of the of the wardens going around at night and telling everybody to black out their windows for exactly exactly the same reason. Okay. Um, what else do we have here in the in the museum? Yeah, as well. Well, we have the. Bullet, bullet Factory Museum, but we also have the Lapua Movement Museum. So in Finnish, this is known as Lapuan Liike. Um, it was a political movement in the, the 20s and 30s? Yeah, from 29 to 32. And uh, it's really hard to put it like in a really, really short nutshell what it was, but basically it was kind of a continuation to the the white Finnish civil war and the civil guard movement and it also took kind of religious and the uh, nationalistic aspects to it but basically it was kind of an anti anti-communist movement which drew from re- real concern about the Like during that time in many countries in Finland, there was a lot of communist activity and they were quite quite straightforward with their like views on the old old world order and religions and things like that. And uh, like the Soter of the Bosnia region is really religious region as well. So it was kind of easy, easy to see why it was seen as a really big opponent to have communist movement in Finland because they kind of opposed the nationalistic uh, na- na- nation view on fin- Finnish nation and also they more or less were atheistic or opposed religious mm-hmm. things and also ownership of land and everything that is so it was two complete opposite yeah. points of view and having strong opinions in general and then strong religious feelings and strong political beliefs that's quite a, a potent mixture really 
Yeah, so. and it's Lapon League and Lapon movement is kind of uh, hot, potato, hot potato as a topic because in a, in a way, especially during the earlier stages, it was kind of a moderate movement and there were many landowners and like common people involved as well. And they managed to pass a law about banning movements that were a threat to the nation. And that was, I'll come, come to back to it later, why it was important, but mm-hmm. they managed to pass that law. And even after that, it, the movement became more and more uh, radical and violent. And uh, as a result of that, many, many people kind of drop out at some point. That of course, that means that the, only the radical people stay and it, it becomes more and more radicalized and it kind of culminated in this thing called muilutus, which, which become, is like a verb from the family name muilu, which was a Lapuan family name. And basically they, when they muiluted people, they craft like very really well-known socialists or communists and drove them all the way to the like the Soviet border and were like uh, drop them off there, like go, go to your utopia over there. And like, like you belong over there. So yeah. go back, go back to the motherland almost. Yeah. And there was a lot of like this kind of more or less terror kind of things that were like beating up non-communists and also nailing suck there, like meeting places. There was like socialist buildings. There usually all hotel meetings at and had concerts and, activities they nailed those places shut so they will not have like any activities there and it was really radical and and eventually it culminated to the Mansala and Kapina the Mansala rebellion where they to put it short it was kind of radical rebellion partially against the state even and at that point there the law that they were putting forward forward to banning the movements that threatened the state actually hit themselves okay. so that their own movement was banned and after that there was the uh, ecoal um so they, they basically they were caught in their own trap yeah okay and the movement was banned but after that there was the the ecoal movement that's i i k l yeah, yeah. Uh, independent nationalistic league i think i i can't remember the exact translation mm. but something along those lines and they kind of continued the same and it was maybe even more, you could see even more strongly the association with other things unraveling in Europe, like Italy, Italy fascist movement, the equal, uh, the, like the basic uniform they had, it was basically mostly black, a okay. black uniform and have a, had a bluish tie. And it was really strong association to the Italian fascist movement. Because the Lapu and Lique logo there is a kind of a, a crest with in, in black, white and blue. Yeah, that, that as well, but especially the Aikua, the Lapu, Lapu movement was a bit, bit different than, even then. And, the, and after, the, after the war with the Soviet Union, the winter one, the continuation war, the, one of the like ultimate, ultimatum the Soviet Union gave as a condition for the peace was was the abolishment of all kind of nationalistic and paramilitary movements. Yes. Yeah. And of course the Laponike Equal was also part of it. And during that time, many of the items and memorabilia and things were destroyed because it was really something that people were more or less ashamed or, or wanted, to, wanted to hide it. Mm. Yeah, and and I think still nowadays people look back on that period with with a little bit of I don't know embarrassment or shame or something that they don't really want to talk about it, or if they come from the red <laughs> part of Finland, then they then they feel some sort of negativity towards it. But and, but you're you're from Lapua, right at the epicenter of of this. So how is it how is it viewed nowadays? Yeah, well, uh, well, it's the same as with the Finnish civil war that the, uh, most of the population didn't participate in the like the activities. Usually, they were more or less in between, and, and of course, there were some people that were on the other side, and the rest of people were on the opposing side. But majority of people didn't take part in it. So it's kind of a topic that some people are really like a shy away from mm. even discussing it. 
but some people are really want to discuss it more like neutrally and of course some people are, have some kind of I could say pride about it because they have so the movement has some interesting aspects that you can maybe even be proud of so Susanna what do you think about how people should view this episode in relation to what's going on in the world now the way the way politics is going now in the world I reckon there are as many um, opinions as there are people or even more opinions for that matter but um, I think it's a great example that this has happened and it can happen again and uh, I think it's an important thing to really uh, show show Labour movement as it was. I mean, I have a really um, personal uh, connection with Labour movement. Uh, Your family's from this area? My family is from this area. I'm born and raised in Labua, and my um, mother's side family name is Muilu. It was okay. <laughs> okay, right. It was my uh, granddad's cousin who gave a name for Muilutus. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, but it wasn't me. No, that's, that's <laughs> and and you know it's a few generations ago. So it's 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 a fascinating story, but it should also give people just food food for thought. Yes, well. uh, that was the time. <laughs> Um, and um, and there there's so much similarities um, what you can see what what's happening in the um, well in whole Europe mm, really mm. that that it's just like like I think it's really important that we uh, we have the Labua movement um, exhibition here and we're even gonna grow it and yeah. um, these days. Um, we do want to tell the story. We can't hide it. We have no reason to hide mm. it. Yeah, with the history, it's it's important to remember because the human nature is the same. Even though we like to think that people back in the day were somehow different and maybe more stupid or something, but they are the same kind of people that are that we currently are and. Mm -hmm. When they think, think about like radical movements like this, we have to remember that the, even they were people, and they have their own reasons for doing things like that. And people today are the are, are, are same kind of people mm -hmm. as well. So we have to remember that things things like that can happen again. And uh, basically, the human nature doesn't really change in good and bad. Uh, it's fasc fascinating to to hear, and it's well worth coming and having a look. You've got one. You've got one. Uh, final sort of section of the museum here, um, which is about uh, a local photography studio. Is that is is that correct? Yeah. Well, basically, in in Lapua, in exactly in 1900, the person named Jaakko Pyhalahti moved to Lapua and started a photography studio in here, and. It basically operated over three generations until 1980. So they basically photographed Lapua and Lapuan people for 80 years. And their uh, uh, negative archives consist of about maybe 150,000 negatives in total. Wow. So it's not, not the fact that there was a photography studio, but it's the, the legacy that's been left behind by this archive yeah basically they photographed the life and people in Lapua for so, so long and as well they were really crucial part in, part in Lapuan life in general they basically when you like had your graduation photo or marriage photo or something taken you usually went to the Pyhala to took it and it was kind of a part of the daily life and rituals like there were Sayings like you aren't really married, married until you have been taken to the Pyhalati to be photographed in your <laughs> marriage clothes. So it was really like a part of the daily life in Lapua. And they also, on their own right, do documented the Lapuan life. Yeah, yeah. And, and I noticed actually some of the Lapuan Like meetings were photographed, you know, by Pyhalati. <laughs> Um, so it's like a, an 80 year documentary photo, yeah. photo documentary. What, what have you got here? What's this room that we're in now? Yeah, basically this is kind of a simulation of the 
Pyhälahti studio and waiting room. Okay. And basically all the items here are from the Pyhälahti photography shops, cameras and everything. And It's the sort of cameras that you, you see on, oh, I don't know, old Charlie Chaplin movies or something like that, old, old black and white movies. Beautiful wooden, um, huge cameras. When you think of, we're, we're running around nowadays with smartphones in our pockets, taking pictures of everything. This was a much more well complicated. Yeah, process, it complicated. And it was more more of special occasion when you went to have your photo taken. It was serious and probably quite expensive for a time as well. And you only got one chance to take that photo. Once the cap comes off the lens, the photo's taken. There's no chance to apply a filter or or just do it again until you get it until you get it right. So yeah. We've well, just renewed this museum. We, I don't know if um, Sakari explained, but we are in process of renewing all our exhibitions uh, in the cultural history museum side. And um, we started from this one. Um, uh, we had opening for the new exhibition in February this year. And uh, we've tried to make it more functional. We, we want people to come here, take Instagram pictures, okay. share them on social media. So you should take one because um, uh, you can sit there and you have the backdrop hand uh, painted in Germany in the late uh, 1800s. So this was used and people were positioned in front of that at the, yeah. at the you, studio. You can yes. see, see them in some of the portraits, the same background. Oh yeah, I can I can see up on the wall. So you've got a selection of pictures that were taken up up here on the on the wall. My favourite pictures are actually here. So we um, we wanted to create this where you can actually touch things and where where you can see that they were quite creative uh-huh. back quite, then. Quite and ris- risque. There's a yes. young lady standing there with nothing on and a rose in her in her hand, and then these are all mounted in in sort of on card or something so yeah. people can pick them up without damaging them. Yeah, these are basically copied from the original yeah. photo store, so it's really, really matter so people can really get the, get the hand on feeling and have the kind of exploration and discovery themselves. And I uh, especially like these ones that were damaged uh, and that there's like a normal, ordinary portraits of a man uh, but then the top of the picture looks um it's just black like uh this cloudy thing so they're very artistic yeah, somehow it does look kind of artistic doesn't it yes. like he, like there's some some kind of strangeness going on in his mind and it's just escaping and being caught by the by the camera yes and this is one of my favorites as well um some sort of a wrestling picture perhaps but that's that's relevant as well because wrestling is quite big still mm. in this in this area. There's a lot yeah, of especially in, in Lapua, the wrestling was one of the sports that Lap- Lapuan people really excelled in. And you can see that backdrop here. Yeah. Okay. So they're they're wrestling in what looks like a grand stately home, but it's actually the backdrop that's that's painted. And there's some background noise that I think we're just picking up now. There's a small room with a, a projector showing. Uh, a black and white movie of Pyhalati, like the family story. Right. Okay. Okay. We're in process of uh, getting subtitles, English subtitles, and that too. So you can come and watch it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I, I think this is definitely somewhere that's worth coming back and seeing. So I think that just about wraps up another show. I'd like to say thank you to Susanna and Sakari for a fantastic experience. If you enjoy the show and you want to show your support, then please take a minute to rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. It will help raise the profile of the show. Connect with me on Facebook, Explore Finland Radio Show, on Twitter, at Explore Finland, or Instagram, it's Mark underscore Explore Finland, or on the website, explorefinlandpodcast.com. Of course, you could also spread the word about the show to your friends on your social network of choice. So let them know about the show, invite them to explore Finland with us. And also, if there's a subject that you want me to cover in a future episode, contact me via the website or social media. I'll be happy to hear from you. But until next time, thanks for listening and see you again on the Explore Finland radio show. Bye bye.